Um, hi, everybody. I am Jocelyn Pryor. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Amped Distribution. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, if you guys can't hear, just let us know and we'll come in closer to these microphones. Um, I want to just thank everybody for coming today, and I want to thank this amazing panel of total marketing badasses. So this is a collective uh, group think over here with a lot of great experience. So you guys are about to get some real gemstones in here. But I want to first just start by talking about physical music. So it grew from 393 million to 690 million in 2021, according to MRC. Can we like maybe get a round of applause for that or something? That's like freaking awesome, okay? <laughs> With that said, if your marketing plans don't include physical, then you're definitely leaving money on the table for your artists and for your labels. And so we really wanna make sure that that's something that's in your equation that you're always thinking about and it will round out the artist's career, it will add longevity, it will add fan engagement and so on. And we will go into more detail on that. But what does it look like to have a solid marketing setup for your physical product? And that's what we're really here to talk about today. So uh, we wanna talk about what it looks like at brick and mortar today. What does co-op funding look like? What is co-op funding? Uh, what are retailers' expectations of the label and artist support? Uh, what are the most cost-effective ways to market at indie retail or at retailers, chains, specialty stores, et cetera? Um, we have long established that artists should be in the physical game. I think that goes without saying. Um, but what it looks like today is a little different in terms of how you set those things up and how you set up that retail and spend and so on. So without further ado, I want to first start off by having the panelists introduce themselves very quickly. Yes. Hi, I'm Laura Pittard. I'm the Director of Marketing at Red Eye Distribution. I'm Jess Lechtenberg, and I'm the Senior Product Manager at Cooking Vinyl America. Hi, I'm Daniel Vasho. I'm Head of Artists and Label Relations at Diggers Factory. Um, I'm Wendy Wessage, and I'm the U.S. Marketing Manager for Rough Trade. Thank you. So, like I said, a team of total badasses here. Um, all right, without further ado, let's just start by talking about brick and mortar and what the lay of the land looks like at brick and mortar. I know we're not post-pandemic yet, but you know, since we've opened back up and things like that. So who wants to start off with that? How about Laura? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to start off. Um, yeah, I, I can say, and I think most people can say this, at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody had the oh shit moment, um, you know, are we all gonna have jobs? Um, but then we were very pleasantly surprised and I myself was um, blown away by uh, independent retailers in particular, their ability to totally pivot stores that never planned on having an online presence in any way, shape, or form, uh, they, took, they took the ball and ran with it um, and really built out their web store presence super quickly um, and did everything that they could to drive customers in. Um, some stores even got so creative to have a dumbbell waiter system uh, <laughs> to deliver records down. So, um, you know, I think um, indie stores, they they have grown um, in Red Eye. I mean, our bread and butter is working with indie indie retailers. So um, it's been amazing to see their growth um, continue. Um, the vinyl demand has really skyrocketed over the pandemic. Um, people stuck at home. They wanted to do everything that they could to build up their homes to make them more comfortable. Um, and a lot of people that uh, we're already into vinyl, um, really got into it even further, and their love deepened. Um, and people that weren't into vinyl yet uh, got even deeper, uh, or they, they discovered it and started building out their collection. And I think we all know that um, once you start collecting records, uh, you're in it for life. Um, so, you know, it's been terrific to see the indie stores just continue to build up their presence. Um, yeah, I think that's. Yeah. From our perspective. Wendy, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. yeah, sure. Well, we've really been doing better than ever. And I think, like you mentioned, e-commerce has really blown up uh, for us. We're actually currently moving to a warehouse twice the size than we were. So um, we're really uh, moving a lot more product. Um, and then, like you said, we're reaching new audiences. Uh, one interesting stat is uh, Vinyl Chick, uh, the hashtag on TikTok, has 3.3 billion views. 
Um, so I think there's really a brand new audience uh, for vinyl records that yeah is emerging. Um, and yeah, we're capitalizing on that. And then brick and mortar itself, like uh, Rough Day just moved to Rockefeller Center a year ago. Um, and tourism is starting again, and we're really seeing it in like foot traffic. And part of these audiences that maybe got introduced to vinyl during the pandemic are visiting, so yeah. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of that, another stat I pulled is, you know, uh, uh, vinyl sales from indie record stores specifically were up 29% in 2021 alone. So, you know, we're hearing all these like buzzwords, you know, it's working, it's working, but to really hone in on it in the US specifically, like we are seeing this uptick. And I think that, you know, pandemic uh, obviously was very difficult for all of us, but it did afford us the time to educate and market to new audiences, younger audiences. You know, I uh, heard a panel a couple of days ago, um, you know, that Gen Z from Discogs, uh, <laughs> that uh, Gen Z is getting a lot of their new music from TikTok, for example. And, you know, that can easily translate to sites such as Discogs, but also independent uh, record stores as well. Mm -hmm. And just to add in on that, I mean, it's obviously great news for everyone in the music industry. And the fact that physical is back is wonderful news and it's more cash on the table for artists, for everyone in the music industry. And I think the whole industry needed that, needed that money. But we're not gonna lie when we say it is, I mean, as a manufacturer, it is a massive challenge. There is more demand than there is pressing capacity for vinyl. So it's great news, but there are more challenges ahead that we're like mm -hmm. all working together on finding solutions to. They're not yeah. only about manufacturing, I think they're also about working new models and pre-orders and, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of, of new ways we can sell and pre-sell records, but it's great news either way. So yeah, and some of the that. reasons why we have some more of that demand, I mean, we already saw the demand go up just you know year over year, year over year, so on and so forth, but we've also seen like Barnes & Noble open around 20 plus new stores. We've seen Best Buy come back on deck. We've seen mass merchants come into the vinyl space. We've seen a lot of that stuff and they're taking on some of those indie titles as well. So um, that's definitely contributing to that, but also that's contributing to the overall growth and visibility of, of our physical products um, out in the marketplace. So let's just talk really, and I also would be remiss if I didn't say broad time because I know you alluded to it, Laura, but broad time really came in and took on about, I think now there are 150 plus independent retailers that they do the back end um, for their e-commerce sites and which brings really cool like abilities to simulcast stuff across indie platforms on their e-commerce side and things like that. So that e-commerce story is so exciting. And we've also seen since um, the stores have started to open back up that, that the stores sales are jumping, but the e-commerce hasn't gone down. So now it's like twofold. So that's also very good news on the, on the lay of the land at brick and mortar and at just retail in general. Um, let's talk about just retail marketing in general and how are you guys going about determining budgets for your retail marketing plans? You want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, quick aside, Cooking Vinyl is distributed through The Orchard. So, you know, I work fairly closely with our distributor in kind of calculating the best approach depending on the release. Um, obviously, as I'm sure most of us in this room are aware, it requires a lot of context, whether or not, you know, this is a new release, a catalog release, if there's artist history in the market. You know, I work at a UK-based company um, so there are some insights I can delve from, you know, my UK based partners, but it's more so I'm doing, you know, the grunt work of pulling sales off MRC and then, you know, kind of going back to my distro team and coming together, uh, estimating projections, you know, there's, there's a bunch of steps, um, for a frontline release, uh, you know, a key release and in, in determining the budget, typically we we do co-op for a key frontline release. Um, and that would typically involve uh, incorporating, you know, Alliance or Sims uh, into that programming. 
And then, you know, I would also get a little more specific just in terms of, you know, market share. Like if my band is established and has a presence in New York City, maybe I'd want to tap Rough Trade, for example, and try to do an activation there. Um, it's a pretty broad question. I think those are like yeah. the, the beginnings of yeah. what I would start to do. Um, but obviously, you know, it's, it's a big part of our overall marketing strategy. And we start having these conversations, you know, six to nine months in advance of any sort of, you know, rollout. It's usually the first conversations that we have in terms of marketing at a label at least. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think just in case people don't know where we manufacture vinyl at Diggers Factory, but we're also a D2C e-commerce platform that basically mixes pre-orders and crowdfunding models. So basically, Artists and labels and any copyright owners basically can manufacture vinyl without advancing any cost. So basically pre-orders cover production costs and so we can really have control of stocks and try to avoid. There are a lot of issues in vinyl. I mean, overproduction and stock and waste are definitely big ones. And I think retail marketing comes in. We work a lot with a lot of indie labels, a lot of indie artists, a lot with directly with the artists. and. To be totally honest, they're often not very confident when we say, maybe we should invest in some retail marketing. We're doing this big rollout with, let's say, Urban Outfitters, maybe Alliance, um, and they were recommending we, we have to invest $5,000 in retail marketing. They're like, well, vinyl, and it's true, vinyl, the cost of production of vinyl has gone up increasingly, and pretty much every month we get increases, and it's due to manufacturers. I mean, the raw material issue is a, is a major issue. And so there's two options. Either we increase the price, the retail price of the vinyl of the record itself, but then that impacts the fan. Um, or we decide to kind of cut corners, maybe on retail marketing. That's sometimes what artists are doing with some of the campaigns we do. And we really try to aim more on free free marketing tools. But I think we'll be talking about that later. And also, I think the most important thing for retail rollouts, physical brick and mortar rollouts, is to focus on the product itself. So you really want to do something special, unique, exclusive editions, really try to make it stand out from maybe the D2C campaign you have or or you have on offer. So so yeah, but we'll talk about free marketing, I guess, a little later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just add, you know, from from my end at Red Eye, very similar uh, to what Jessica was talking about as far as um, you know, uh, our emphasis at Red Eye is like talking with labels as far out as possible. So um, having a conversation, ideally, we're really six months plus out. Having the first conversation about records, I mean, a year is amazing. Yeah. I mean, that's what manufacturing <laughs> is happening. So it's like, hey, if you're as soon as you're putting your record into manufacturing, let us know. Let's let's have like a great big discussion with the whole team, sales and marketing team, to hear what your goals are. Um, what's the artist's vision for this release? What's you know what's the artist's uh, aesthetic for this record? What are they trying to convey? And then that gives us the opportunity to really you know tailor our marketing campaign to those specific goals. So you know there are certain things, certain partners that we always love to work with. Rough Trade, uh, they're an amazing partner. Um, but you know looking at you know hey this artist might be on tour in these markets you know, nine months from now. How can we tap into uh, those tour markets and, you know, put that as part of the overall marketing plan. So, you know, really it's having that conversation with the label as far out as possible. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that, that aren't, you know, $5,000, um, but you have to be smart about it. And I think, you know, you have to take a realistic look at, um, you know, what your goals are as a label, um, what your ship expectations are. Um, but also like one great thing about vinyl is it's non-returnable. So you might spend some money for marketing, but you're not getting those records back. It's not like eight, nine years ago when you had to seriously consider, okay, Starbucks. I remember, anybody no. remember Starbucks? <laughs> uh, shipping CDs to Starbucks, but just to have 80% of them come back, you know? So um, the great thing about vinyl is like, yes, it's an investment to, uh, to do co-op um, at, at indie record stores, but it's a great investment because once they're out there, they're out there. You got paid and they're not coming back. So I think that's a great thing to keep in mind. Yeah, and one thing I would add to just bounce off of that is um, I feel like at Indie Week, we like spoke a lot about how to make a track go viral on TikTok, but that's very top funnel. 
Um, and with social media marketing, if you're spending your dollars there, you're kind of like playing the lottery of attention. Uh, but at record stores, we're really like engaging with our customers um, and we're trying to build uh, maybe their relationship to the artist into a long-term relationship. So you really, as a label or as you're trying to build the artist's career, it, you're investing into it long-term. Um, that's, that's a great perspective because if you're like an, a media buyer and you're talking about CPMs and stuff like that, like cost per thousand and whatnot, they always go up when it's a targeted market. It, retail is like the most targeted market, right? I right. mean, it's really quite an engaged audience. They made a trip to the store. So that you're absolutely right on that. Um, and I know also at Amped, we also are asking people to start before they're even manufacturing. We wanna talk about what your goals are, what the lay of the land is, and then reverse engineer what your quantities should be, but also what your marketing then subsequently will be as well. If you've got a couple of variants with a couple of retail partners and so on and so forth, that's gonna both inform your your manufacturing numbers, but it's gonna inform your marketing as well. Um, and then we also talk about how to not spend money. So <laughs> that's, that's right. the other thing we all like. <laughs> um, how are you determining, uh, uh, let's see, Laura, I'll start with you. Yes. How are you determining the stores uh, like where, what programs, what are you looking at there? Yeah, that, so that's a great question. Um, you know, from from our perspective, I mean, like I mentioned, indie stores are our bread and butter. We we do marketing as well with you know Urban Outfitters and everything, um, all the other retailers. But um, you know, one thing that that our team on the marketing side is really looking at when we're trying to determine markets is actually Spotify. I mean, Spotify, Apple Music. We have that information about key DMAs. You can look in Spotify for artists and see, okay, this artist is from the UK, but randomly maybe their number one top market is Madison, Wisconsin. You know, so let's let's look at that. Let's look at the independent record stores there, um, and you know, take a look to see Electric Fetus. Um, <laughs> take a look and uh, you know, plan around that. So you already know that the that there's a fan base there. So um, expand that out um, from the digital side to the physical side. Um, and one thing we, we like to tell our retail partners is, you know, when we see um, something happening, whether it's like radio ads, a college radio, or, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, um, top markets for those artists, um, tell the store and say like, hey, actually, you know, there's a lot going on for this artist here in your town. Um, how can we best partner together? Um, and it really depends on each specific release. Um, you know, there are obviously some titles that um, it's a developing artist, and we want to try and do everything that we can to build out um, broadly their fan base. But also, there are, there are artists that aren't tour, and they're tour warriors, especially now that touring is back in full force. Um, and you know, it's it's the best thing in the world when an artist goes into a record store and they find the records. And I think we all know probably it's the worst when that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so you know, trying to map out and plan far ahead to see like, okay. How can we best position this release um, to both build out uh, the existing fan base everywhere, but look at those targeted accounts, targeted markets um, where it makes the most sense? Yeah, I mean, and just to piggyback off of that, um, agreed. Uh, I think, you know, I feel like touring now is a luxury I have, you know, I have this mm -hmm. kind of like map of all the places my mm -hmm. artist is finally going to be able to be at. Um, I think also uh, during this awful time, I think artists also saw an emphasis on physical and were able to kind of wrap their heads around why it's so important and why it's such a crucial part of their campaign. You know, like working at Cooking Vinyl, I have a variety of artists, you know, and like the the uh, indie retail needs of Kiefer Sutherland versus Nina Nesbitt, who's like a, you know, a pop artist are very, very different, you know, and like the audiences are very different. Um, but I'm having, you know, similar conversations, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm narrowing down regions that are working um, versus ones that maybe I'll just, you know, set to, to the side and prioritize, you know, like middle America or, you know, Barnes Noble or like a big box play versus, um, you know, an exclusive giveaway for the tour, um, let's say like in Los Angeles. It's like, there's, there's a lot more to play with now that we're able to be active in, you know, safe and appropriate ways. 
Um, and so it's, it's like we kind of have all the benefits now and everyone's a lot more enthusiastic and energized to kind of get in the ring and, and see what we can make work. I mean, I've been really surprised um, just in terms of pre-order numbers, like what physical items, um, you know, audiences are gravitating towards depending on an artist. Like I've seen really strong CD sales this year. I've seen re really strong like standard LP sales and pre-orders as well. Um, and that's not something I would have traditionally seen like prior to the last two years or whatever. Um, and I think that's that's also because like the audience is there and people are very hungry for more material and, you know, they're kind of working with the limitations that they've had. Um, and all that being said, it's like, yeah, I think I'm able to kind of get a little more site specific when I get really excited about a front line release. I can, you know, see like, oh, what can I do with Newberry? Like, mm -hmm. I know all the programming for like specific, you know, key retailers and then like, you know, programming through Alliance or Sims. And then depending on the artist, I can kind of like, you know, make my little, uh, my, my house a home, so to speak, if that yeah. makes sense. But yeah. Uh, can you tell I'm into this? Um, so, so yeah, so it, it really, really varies, but I think that's what keeps it exciting, you know, depending on the artist and the audience base, like you want to super serve that. And I think that's the fun part of marketing is like how diverse that can be depending on the artist. For sure. I think, I think data is essential. I mean, <clears throat> Laura, you touched on that, but working with distributors, the first thing they'll definitely ask us is if we can send them data from social media streaming platforms, any DSPs, any data we can give the distributor, they will be happy to exploit that and create the rollout dependent, whether it be territorial or, or within a specific territory even, they will definitely ask us for data. I think also previous, I mean, if it's not first albums, first projects, previous sales is a simple first step and they will always check the history of previous sales. We launched, for example, not long ago, a, an anniversary, 20 year anniversary, LP of Exhibits Man vs. Machine. And obviously it came out 20 years ago, so it's massive sales history. And we know exactly where it sold then, and there's a big chance that's where it's going to sell today. So data definitely, also touring, you mentioned touring 100%, something that gets distributors ex excited, sorry. Um, if a band is touring, our distributors will honestly maybe double the quantity they'll order from us because the band is touring. So so yeah, and for developing artists, I, I think obviously if there's no sales history, if the data isn't really that big on social media platforms and DSPs, I think you base it on the genre. So we do a lot of lo-fi, for example, and we know in South Korea and Japan, it is something that will make decent numbers. So developing artists will focus on genres uh, and territories in which those genres work. But yeah, that's definitely a place you can yeah yeah and to just bounce off of that um i think we look at data in the other way um where maybe like you say if the artist is more emerging um we're going to look at what our customers like and recommend that artist to the customers we think um would actually enjoy the music so i think you you can look at it sure. in both ways where Definitely. um find new fans yeah mm -hmm. And Daniel, you're totally right, because as a distributor at Amped, we're like, OK, tell us the story. What is the buildup going to look like? And then we look at that and say, OK, here are the programs, here are the markets, here are the stores. This is how we're going to pair that up. And, and then, you know, let's talk to Wendy and let's find out what she's got available. And, you know, let's look at her brand new media kit that I just got. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, so let's talk about, dare I say it, split street dates. Let's talk about marketing of split street dates um, and at retail. And I'm gonna actually start back at the end here, Wendy, with you about what does that look like when the rubber meets the road at the store? How do you market in the store a split street date, meaning the vinyl is going to come later than the CD or other configurations? Yeah, well, obviously, yeah. Nobody likes that. <laughs> um, but I feel like the customer at this point is kind of like, educated to the fact that maybe the streaming is going to come before um, the physical product. Um, and I think maybe looking at it in that way, where there's maybe more opportunities to um, promote a release um, in the lead up. Um, we do a lot of our business on pre-orders um, for e-com. So I think 
uh, thinking of ways of evolving the record store before release week, uh, even on a co-op side, is like one way to maybe, um, yeah, get things going before even that issue arises. <laughs> but um, then after that, obviously, if you want to do something in store, um, typically we'd recommend like doing it around the vinyl release because uh, I think that's just a product that is easier to uh, place on end caps in the store, etc. So. Um, but, or both. Yeah. It's kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. Figuring it out. <laughs> Jess, you want to go up sure. next? Um, yeah, split release dates. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only label rep in here are the bane of my existence currently, <laughs> um, and have been for, um, a while. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's been quite a bear to wrestle with, you know, we can only control so much, uh, no one can anticipate a nickel shortage or, you know, a lacquer factory catching on fire or um, other very unfortunate scenarios that we've all been uh, witness to and had to, you know, fall prey to, unfortunately. Um, I think that in 2022, it's a, it's a lot friendlier of an environment <laughs> when you are telling uh, audiences and customers that there will be a delay uh, due to, you know, whether it's manufacturing or typically for us, it's, you know, just shipping delays. It's just, you know, it's it's literally getting the product from Europe to America is a whole thing, you know? And there, there are longer lead times that we have to take into account that weren't really the case before, like rising gas prices and all this stuff. It's not really an answer to the question. Um, but my point is, is that like with with all of that context in mind, you know, like what do you how do you market that to the audience? An audience doesn't care that like, you know, it's stuck on a boat somewhere. Right. Um, I think that uh, people are a lot more forgiving now. I think having, you know, a CD come in always helps, like having a piece of physical as, you know, like a holding place tends to help. Um, I, I agree pre-orders tend to be like our strongest moment in terms of marketing and it also is the time to inform and educate the audience. So if you see like, okay, the release date is going to get bumped, you know, this is the time to message that in like a cohesive way, um, perhaps from the artist, perhaps from, you know, a key, uh, store partner, if they're <laughs> comfortable doing that, you know, there, there are a lot of ways to get creative. I think it's also opportunities for, you know, POP items and like kind of incentivize buyers, kind of anticipate those delays. That's kind of where my head's been at lately. It's like, okay, you're going to have to wait a really long time for this, but it's super special because of X, Y, and Z, you know? Um, and like, again, like as marketers, like that's kind of our job is like tell the story, uh, paint the picture, but also like maintain the enthusiasm and keep the story going um, as long as you need to, essentially. Um, and I think that with those split release dates, it's actually created more opportunities for us to talk about the record for longer, you know, get it into, you know, maybe touring kind of aligns nicely with that final release date. And maybe it didn't before and mm -hmm. stuff like that, like become opportunities rather than like whole, like setbacks, so to speak. Yeah. Daniel, do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, we're kind of part of the reason there are split dates, uh, in a sense, because, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it's they're here to stay, though. Manufacturing uh, lead times aren't going to get any better until maybe Q1 2024. So they're here to stay for the foreseeable future. And I think we just all need to adapt. I think you're totally right that the customer customers are educated now that, and they understand they might have to wait, honestly, six months for a record. And super fans and even non-super fans are ready. They accept it. They know that. They have the music on their DSPs. Uh, they'll probably go to a show and they'll get their record a few months after that. But I think it's also important for labels and artists, and main, mainly artists, because the, the labels know that we need elements. I know it's hard, but at least 18 weeks before um, before we, we get the press and launch and then we have long manufacturing leads. So the album, all the assets have to be ready. We're almost looking at a year before the album is released. Mm -hmm. And I totally understand that's uh, almost impossible, but I think you, you labels are getting used to that and doing your best. I mean, the Nina Nesbitt was a perfect 
perfect example. We're working together on that one. And the album comes out September 24th, I believe. Yeah, and the pre-order went live like a couple weeks ago, so it's pretty fresh on That's my mind. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but but we made it happen and, yeah. and it's just it's just part of the lay of the land yeah. now and I think everyone's going to get educated to it and we're all going to adapt as as we are doing. I, I want to come to Laura to talk about how you determine your ad spends between C the different configurations and stuff on those split street dates. But before I do, I just want to make a PSA to any of the manufacturers that are out there that we really would covet your um, your dates to be more accurate. So if we can get those dates, you know, pad them, whatever you need, because as marketers and publicists and things like that, it, we're working towards dots on a timeline, those marketing ticks that we're all working towards. And so if we have to go back and undo everything we've done because a date is a week off, kill us now. So that would be so helpful from the manufacturing community. Spread the word, please. Um, just to have those dates be a little bit more accurate as much as possible. That would be helpful on the marketing side so that we really can maximize the amount of sales that and the opportunities there. Um, but I want to move back to you um, from the distribution perspective and talk about um, how you are determining ad spends because, you know, obviously with two different dates and two different marketing timelines and you could be double spending and we don't want to necessarily do that and we may not have the budget to do that. So what, yeah, what yeah, do you that's a, that's what do? That's a great do? question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly a struggle. Um, obviously, you know, it always sucks when you have to split up the street dates, but um, it happens and it, it happens more frequently now than it used to um, and we've accepted that. So I think, you know, as you touched on, um, the best thing you can do is just work with your distributor and let them know their your new release date as soon as possible um, so we can adjust um, because everything, all the marketing that we booked, um, we have to go back to stores like rough trade and tell them actually i know we had this booked but we're gonna need to move it a month out it's not the best conversation to have <laughs> um it's so many people talking having the conversation way more times than it needs to happen but um going back to actual spends um one benefit uh sometimes of having a split release date is you know if the record is really strong people have fallen in love with the record and they you're streaming it and streaming it and they actually really it builds up the demand you know and they they covet <laughs> and they're going to go out of their way uh to buy it on vinyl um so when it comes to setting like a a retail budget um you know it really comes down to looking at the holistic plan um if there's tour dates uh around the vinyl release date obviously try and try and hone that in um but yeah, I mean, it's kind of a mixed bag when it comes to the actual budget portion. Uh, obviously, you know, we work with independent labels uh, that don't have thousands upon thousands of dollars to spend. So I would concentrate on, you know, top markets um, and where you really want to make the biggest um, bang. Um, I do want to touch back on something that you all brought up um, about having artists uh, involved in promoting. I think that is the, one of the most important things you can do whenever you have a split release date. I'll call it partisan because they're in the room. Um, idols, uh, we did everything possible to keep the release date last year. Um, the label was phenomenal in trying to, um, you know, part the ocean to make it happen. But it did bump, and um, the the artist uh, idols did an amazing job on their social media saying, "Hey, we tried really hard, but and the real final release date is going to be later." So that is like the most important thing you can do. It doesn't cost any money either. Um, but it gets the word out more than anything. So please yeah. do that. <laughs> and there are some retailers like, or coalitions even like Sims and Doors that have split street date programs. So then our job is to determine what is the what is the right configuration to put the brunt of the money on, right? So if I know I may not have enough stock, I may go into allocations on the vinyl release, I might put the money on the CD configuration, which is going to come first. And I will also just add one of your best practices you can do is at least launch your pre-book of the vinyl at the same time you're launching the rest of the announce or the rest of your titles, because then we can start to harness whatever ad spend you had on the front end. Even if it's on a different configuration, you can start to harness the customer 
support on that too. So that's a best practice. If you can, if you can swing it, great. That would definitely be ideal. Um, I know we're getting close to time here, so I just want to talk really quickly about free marketing and what, because we've talked a lot about spending money at retail and definitely that's something that needs to be considered, um, you know, dollar per unit, $2 per unit, you guys determine the equation there, but let's talk about the free marketing opportunities and then we'll open it up to some questions. So who wants to start first? Sure. Jess. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, a call to action from the artist is always super helpful. I think that artists have an incentive now more than ever um, to, you know, communicate very like fluently with their fans. I think, you know, social media being what it is, it's like that's always free marketing, right? Um, I think it really depends like what what your artist and what that audience is into, like a certain artist and audience would be into like an unboxing video. Like I love unboxing videos, you Me know, too. that's such a simple, easy thing, potentially depending <laughs> on the artist <laughs> um, to, you know, capture and prop up um, on YouTube or whatever their their preferred channel is, whether it's YouTube or TikTok or whatever. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about TikTok. Uh, you know, 75% of users on TikTok uh, discover new music there, right? So um, that's another great example um, of ways to just like reach Gen Z and that sort of thing. Um, I'm just trying to think of like what else, like I, call yeah. outs from the artist on live streams yeah. or like, I don't know. Yeah, what am I, missing? I would say, you know, on the red eye side, um, like I mentioned, you know, indie labels, not a lot of money. So we love to get creative, um, you know, test pressing give giveaways are amazing. Um, you know, if you're already manufacturing, just manufacture 10, 20 extra. Um, we can reach out to stores like Rep Trade and say, hey, would you be interested in doing a giveaway? Um, the store will post it on their social media at no cost for most stores. Um, some stores, they, there's a cost, um, but you know, that's a free thing you can do. Um, promo CDs, you know, people still buy CDs, supposedly. I'm not one of them, but um, they, they are out there. Um, so we do a dedicated like promo mailing to indie stores across the country. Um, you know, it's overhead airplay. So one of, uh, you know, fan goes in, a customer goes in, they can, I'm a new fan of the artist just by hearing it. Um, uh, promo pack giveaways too. I mean, if you're a label and you wanna brand your label more um, while also promoting a new release, um, put together a tote bag, a label t-shirt, um, 45 adapter, uh, you know, a signed uh, copy of the record um, and we can send it to the store and give it away and there's no cost for that, but it's a really cool thing for the fans. Um, it's a cool thing for the stores, um, cool thing for Red as a distributor, um, you know, for everybody. And it doesn't cost anything except, you know, the cost of manufacture, but a lot of those things you already have manufactured. So just putting it all together. Sorry, I would also add listening events is a really simple, um, you know, tool in your toolbox of, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is indie retail and it's about the community that indie retail is able to create. And that can be like the, foundation of your fan base and your your audience base and that's something to be celebrated and doing like a really simple playback of the record you know for their eyes only and that kind of exclusivity like what are you what are you spending money on like maybe an open bar if that but like it's it's so dependent on you know again the demo and and the the artist but that's such a simple thing to draw a lot of buzz and excitement around a record is like getting that sneak peek sort of thing yeah, yeah to, to, oh sorry go for it go for it i was gonna say took the words right out of my mouth <laughs> <laughs> um no but i think events just in general um uh, listening parties, of course, and we're doing a lot of those also um, that we make a little bit more special around maybe a reissue, which is like because records are our place for gathering. So I think any opportunity we have to do that. Also, um, obviously, events, there's performances there's signings. But even if your artist is on tour and is not comfortable, like having 100 people like line up in front of them, uh, have them come by the store, sign records in the back, and then we'll capture some promo content and we'll promote it on our socials. Um, I think, yeah, just having the artists stop by the store since tours are 
happening again, uh, that's always something we value a lot and we want to yeah, promote that kind of stuff. So events. <laughs> Yeah, that's literally what I was going to say. Well, there you go. <laughs> but signed events, I mean, distributors in most of the countries and most of our distributors always ask for signed events, if possible. Usually where the artist is from, so in their local indie store or so. But events definitely work. I think CRM and mailing is super underestimated. It's probably our most powerful tool. And always give them a giveaway or something or, or even get creative, you know. We had one artist the idea was good, it didn't work great, but it could work for someone else. He had this idea and he was like, okay, let's do this QR code, print QR codes, put them all over the city <clears throat> and get people to, who gets the QR code to get a discount at the mm -hmm. retail store. Anyway, lots of ops can be done, just be creative, mm -hmm. use mailing and use social media, definitely. Yeah, I agree. And also um, one of my absolute very favorite things is the indie option that Record Store Day offers. If you have a smart URL, make sure you're always systematically tagging that alongside your DSPs and everything else that you're planning on tagging in there. Um, and then if you shoot that over to the indie option at recordstoreday.com, they will tweet that out for free and they have a sizable um, Twitter following. And so that's something as a matter of course you can always do and that's free. Also, uh, making sure that your distributor has multiple images on everything. That's super important that we know data is one of the biggest um, selling uh, sales agents um, nowadays. And so for sure, for all the e-commerce land, we want to have all of those multiple images. Um, and then for like Amazon and stuff, we can always make A plus pages where we put video and load video stuff and um, multiple images and banners and stuff. Also adding social media banners, um, like giving a suitcase of those to indie retail. They love it, they'll use it, and uh, that's a lot of legs and that's all free. So that's another uh, free bent there that we do at Amped. Um, I just wanna open this up. I know we don't have but a few minutes left and if there are any questions, we're happy to take them. Hi there, great panel. I uh, just have two questions. One is, I, I've heard, I mean, as a label, we have a really hard time getting, um, sticking to predictable dates for delivery. Some labels are telling me that they reserve time at plants. Is that something that is a common practice amongst labels that you're finding, that they're reserving time at plants so they know, for example, they book time in October, and they know if they do that, they're going to have vinyl delivered on time. And my second question is, are you finding a lot of labels that are doing test pressings, or a lot of labels just to avoid the, the extra delay of doing time pressings, test pressings, are not doing test pressings. Daniel, you wanna take that? Yeah, sure, well, um, on the your second question, we've never not done test pressings with, and we work with many, many labels and artists. They know it's an option and we sometimes offer it if really the timeline is very tight, though we never recommend it um, because you don't wanna press no matter what the quantity is and have ticks and clicks um, and have unhappy customers. So to be honest, we don't recommend it. Um, it is an option. Manufacturers will do it, but we've never done it and we hope not to do it. And your first question was, yes, we, we can and we do uh, reserve capacity at the pressing plants. That's the way we work. We basically have blocked monthly pressing capacity. So let's say 30K in one plant, 20K in another plant. And so we can stick to timelines, but the important element is elements. So we need the assets a very minimum of eight weeks before press and so that capacity can be blocked for your release but if we don't get the elements in time we lose we lose that pressing capacity and if we're talking 10,000 units we're going to lose 10,000 units and so that's a, a big issue so we do offer reserve capacity to our clients um, but assets is the master word and we need those assets in time if not we will lose the capacity but yes it's a it's a practice that is used also build in time for things unforeseen like weather, labor force, COVID, all the things that can affect uh, any kind of a pressing plant. Adele. <laughs> Adele. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, do you have any other questions? Any other questions? items like are you seeing it being the same I mean obviously it'll totally vary by, vary by the artist but are you seeing it being the same fans that are streaming or are they mm -hmm. different fans that are just purchasing physical Wendy sure well um different bands have different fan bases of course uh, one thing interesting um, that I've noted the last few record store days 
uh, has been that those like 10 first people in line have been younger people um, who came and purchased maybe a pop record like uh, Fleetwood Mac was like obviously a big one uh, a couple of record stores days ago um, and uh, Nicki Minaj like is promising to be one of the big records on Saturday because it's record store day on Saturday ah. uh, <laughs> but yeah so so we are seeing definitely like different demographics um, come through and yeah based on the type of music or the artist yeah it's kind of a personal yeah, yeah. We're also seeing things like there's a very young teenage uh, contingency that want CDs um, for like indie alternative music. Where that comes from, it's unusual, but here we are. And uh, you know, the cassette audience is an unusual audience as well. There's a couple of different groups of that. We know that a lot of hard rock metal fans are still opting in for CD over LP. So it, it is really, by genre, by demographic, psychographic, even within a demographic, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah. Anybody else? Oh, and mm -hmm. what? Yes. We'll make it very quick. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the, the resurgence of physical media has been astounding, but at the same time, um, most people, I mean, myself included, who have, you know, sizable vinyl collections are still primarily streaming. You know, I, mm -hmm. I listen, I stream albums I own that's like mm -hmm. right next to my yeah. stereo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but how do we make sure that this resurgence keeps going and that this is sustainable as prices go up or as trends, you know, change, demographics change, things like that? How do we make sure that this isn't just you know, a peak that then just drops back off. Jess, you want to go back? Sure. Um, I mean, not to like shout anybody out too hard, but I uh, I previously worked at Beggars Group, and I think that um, they do a really good job as the as a captain of cool, <laughs> of kind of maintaining um, that audience and justifying the spend uh, for vinyl and for variants of that vinyl and kind of creating excitement around catalog releases and like whatever whatever they have. I think. Um, I think your question is is marketing. I mean, the answer is marketing, right? It's like just justify my job. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I I would be very curious if if final like ever goes away. You know, kind of making time to do a little research before this panel. I was really relieved to find that you know. Gen Z is buying a lot more vinyl than millennials. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm happy to, to see that and hear that. Um, I think that there is a level of investment like in a craft. And I think that it is a form of participation when an audience member is able to buy a piece of you know, vinyl or what, whatever, you know, whatever the product is, I think they do feel closer to that artist in a way that like streaming or sorry, like NFTs or any of these like newer things like our, our engines to the, to the same goal ultimately. But I think nothing can kind of change the feeling that you get when you're like holding a piece of, you know, vinyl in your hand and you get to like play it on a stereo. And I think that like, I do the same thing, you know, I stream music all the time, but I also put time aside to listen to vinyl and I consider it like a very, you know, like whatever meditative experience of like, you know, I, I'm really paying attention to the music. I'm listening to an album all the way through. I think there is that practice that, you know, it's so rare these days. And I, I, I think that's also why Gen Z is gravitating towards it because it, they are just constantly like, you know, being marketed to, and then they can just kind of take a beat an hour or whatever it is and just really like listen to the music as cheesy as that sounds. Well, I will say also like, kind of like to reinforce what you're saying, like I think as long as there's fandom, people are gonna want to own something that like showcases that, I think a lot of Gen Z also maybe buy the records and just put them on their walls. Yeah. Like that vinyl check hashtag I mentioned before, it's like, look at my wall with all my vinyls on it. Like, and it's just the artwork. But I think it's just like a way of expressing uh, really that your your admiration or your love for that artist goes deeper than just, yeah, listening to the music and appreciating the music. K-pop is a good example of that. I'll buy all 12 or nine variants and then stream it. 
So I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's a good example of that as well. Right. Um, I think, I think we're at time. So I thank everybody for being here. I thank this amazing panel. Thank you.